Hey, I won a gravel race. Specifically the Steamboat Gravel 100 mile blue course, which was a pleasant surprise. Not so surprising was the women's winner, Tiffany Cromwell of Canyon Shram, taking the title in the blue course. And in the pro 140 mile black course, the human motorcycles of Lauren DeCrescenzo and Keegan Swenson took their respective titles. What was surprising was what Keegan was doing with his tires, both inside and outside. Hint, they involve some snips. In this video, I want to tell you about what Keegan was doing, and I want to talk about my bike setup in terms of what I tested with wheels and tires, what I liked, what I didn't like, and what I would do differently in the future. Before we dig into it, let me tell you about who I am briefly. I've been covering cycling, both the bikes and the professional riders for more than 20 years. I've tested hundreds of bikes, road and gravel, and I've tested dozens of gravel bikes inside events. What I'm doing with this channel is a continuation of my life's work, which is sharing what I learned and continue to learn about bikes. What this is not is a sponsored thing or an affiliate sales driving thing. That is not what I'm trying to do. I want to continue to share my independent, honest, and comparative reviews about bikes and gear inside of events. If that's something you're into, which I hope it is, please support me by subscribing. Okay, preachy part over. Let's dig into the good stuff. I like to provide context whenever possible about how the bike and or gear performs in a particular setting and how that gear compares to other gear. So the setting here is Steamboat Gravel, which is a rad cycling event in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Often in gravel, the event reflects the event director. And at Steamboat Springs, where Amy Charity runs the show, the course, like her, is beautiful and smooth and tough as nails. One thing I love about Steamboat is it's a whole weekend. It's a three day, it's a four day festival. The races on Sunday, there's four different distances you can choose from, but there are events all the way uh, leading up to that. There's a lot of different shakeout rides. I really enjoyed this year getting to meet Reggie Miller, the NBA Hall of Famer who is leading a kid's ride and just proving to be a wonderful human being through and through, that was cool. I also enjoyed doing a couple of shakeout rides which serve a few purposes. One, they're a fun social thing. You get to catch up with old friends, meet some new folks. And two, you get to make sure that nothing's gonna rattle off your bike. If you watch some of my earlier videos, you know I've failed to do this on a few occasions. So this year I uh, got out with some of the Pinarello crew, uh, including Brennan and Wirtz, and we got to take a peek at the uh, Cow Creek section, which is probably the, the roughest section on the course. And as we were coming back, the, there was a chamois butter shakeout ride uh, going on out with hundreds, if not <laughs> seemingly a thousand people. Great to see so many people out on bikes, uh, enjoying the setting, enjoying gravel in the uh, non-competitive setting before race day on Sunday. After having done the black 140 mile course last year, I picked the 100 this year, the Fundy Hundy, which is my preferred sweet spot for a lot of these events. I'm a big fan of doing a big event, the full distance at some point uh, in your life, some point in the year, whether that's you know Unbound or Steamboat Belgian Waffle Ride or a local gravel ride. I think there is value in doing the biggest distance there is, especially if that is a stretch goal for you, which it can be for me for sure. That said, I don't think it's a good idea to do the big one weekend in and weekend out. Uh, much like it's all fine and good to get drunk sometimes, but like every Tuesday night, maybe not so much. Also, my alibi, which is true for doing the 100 instead of the 140, is that it allows me to cover the pro race uh, before they leave and uh, get back to the finish before they come back in. This year, for instance, I was doing a tech gallery for cycling news. I'll put the link to that down below this video. Steamboat Gravel starts out on pavement. There's one steep kicker on the asphalt before we get right into the good stuff. With the early morning light and dust getting kicked up, the uh, visibility is a bit of a challenge, so it's always good to stay near the front if you can. The first third of the course uh, trends upwards with a number of rollers uh, breaking up the field a bit. Like many gravel races, it's a story of attrition with the field slimming with each uh, progressive roller as the day goes on. 
Early on, I was happy to follow the wheels of people like Tiffany Cromwell. I know she knows what she's doing on a bike. And Nick Gould, the Lauf Mazda rider who was giving it the gas from seemingly, you know, the first mile. At Steamboat Gravel, I was testing two things. New wheels from Reserve, the 25GR, which as the name implies are 25 mil internal gravel wheels uh, and Schwabe G1 speed tires. These G1s are printed as 38 mil, but on the wide reserve wheels, they plump up to about 41, which is uh, definitely on the wide side for a relatively smooth course like Steamboat Gravel. The speeds, as the name implies, are basically a slick. I've ridden the G1s in a number of different iterations from the original to the R to the RS. With the latter two, I've ridden it, uh, the Unbound Gravel 200 uh, and 100. I wanted to try these speeds because it is a roadie course of sorts at Steamboat Gravel. One choice I regretted last year was not running a Camelback and just running three bottles on the frame. At the time I had the Trek checkpoint in for test, so I had three bottles. I stopped at a feed zone, uh, others did not, and I regretted that for the rest of the day. So this year I came equipped with the Camelback. There's always the, the trade-off, right? Like you want to have water, you don't want to stop, but uh, watts per kilo is a thing and that includes the kilos of the entire package, including you know what you're carrying on your bike. I decided ultimately it was worth it having water with. The big split for our race uh, came on the long climb at about a third of the way. I put my data up on fastcatcoaching.com. I'm content director part-time there. You can check out the stats to stop or not stop for water was a contentious issue last year. You may remember Bottle Gates. I wrote the story on Bell News about the Lauren DeCrescenzo and their cinch teammates and other women riders in the race. And there was a bit of a kerfuffle there about who should stop and win. This year, same story on the men's side, back in the blue course. I was happy to have my camel back in and I did not stop until the very last feed zone on the day. I did get separated from the two leaders, Nick Gould and uh, another young rider who was able to go with him on the steepest part of the longest climb in our course. Um, but I settled in with about five or six riders to chase and again was ultimately happy that I had the extra water and hydration on my back. A fun feature of Steamboat Gravel is a single track section in the ranch portion after the long climb. There we were coming through a lot of riders from the black course that made it a little tricky about you know, trying to get past. You don't want to be a jerk face, but you also don't want to get dropped from the, the group you're in. That was all fun riding through the, the fields and the water up there. That put us back onto the pavement where there were some flats and then a great fun descent where I was happy to have effectively a slick tire. Uh, there, Eric Dorf, who ended up second on the day, was uh, taking pulls from me as we put our dad watts and our dad weight to work on the downhills. Fast forward towards the end of the race, the rider who was with Nick came off. There ended up being three of us uh, in pursuit. We caught Nick, there were four. That dwindled down to three as young Thomas came off due to cramps. Sorry about that, my friend. And then it was three of us heading up the last climb of the day where we were basically crawling and in survival mode and looked at each other and all agreed to call a truce and stop for water quickly. Then we bombed down uh, a smoother dirt section and then into Cow Creek, the rough section of the day, where again, I was happy to have previewed that uh, with Sarah Max and Brennan Wirtz and some others the day before. So I had a good idea of like where the chunkier parts were and where the sandier parts were. And I was just following Nick on his Lauf True Grit with the leaf suspension fork uh, through that chundery bit. Coming into the finish, I was so focused on doing a good sprint, I forgot to turn on my GoPro. But I was thinking as I wound it up and was able to come around Eric uh, of what Reggie Miller has painted on his bike, which says, don't stop when you're tired, stop when you're done. So I kept it going and was able to get over the line first and was happy to take a win at Steamboat Gravel Blue. So gear, what did I like? What did I not like? What would I return with again? And what would I change? The hydration pack, I like the concept of. I'm keen to try the USWE, the USWE pack, which is a much more minimalistic 
uh, version, this Camelback Chase I have, which just has a ton of pockets. And I saw my friend Kristen Legan running a Camelback Chase where she's cut off a lot of the excess pockets, so it's just a, a slimmer version. The U Suite has something similar like that out of the box, so I'm curious to check that out. But hydration pack, yes, do it. For the tires, they were a little wider maybe than was necessary, but uh, I certainly wasn't complaining about the comfort. And similarly, the wheels. There's you know a lot of specs that you can read about and you can do a compare and contrast when you're shopping, but you can't feel them. Uh, there's some things where you can notice the difference. Yeah, certainly the price, like that does take a bite, but long spokes versus short spokes, you can feel that. When you ride a, a really deep aero wheel, like a 60 mil wheel for, some, for instance, then you switch over to a box wheel, you can feel the box rim wheel is more comfortable because like a, there's just more give to the spoke. So that's certainly noticeable here that this is a, a pretty comfortable wheel. It's not designed as a race wheel. So there's, it's always a trade-off, right? It's always a balance. And being a guy who's still eager to go fast despite uh, uh, the declining speeds, I probably would go back with an air wheel of sorts. Trees falling down. To compare to some other setups, you know, I rode Envy's G23 at Unbound Gravel 200. Uh, that, again, as the name implies, is a 23 mil internal rim. So wide, not quite as wide as this, but designed for comfort with a long spoke, very shallow rim. It's a comfortable wheel. In a wind tunnel, it's not gonna be blowing anybody out of the water. The NV34 is a wheel I've had a lot of experience with, and that may be sort of the sweet spot in terms of comfortable enough, but certainly more aerodynamic at speed. That does take a bite on price though. The 3.4 is like 2,500 bucks. These wheels are in the $1,600 range. For tire tread profile, I'm pretty sold on a slick or nearly slick center tread. And then I'm still kind of up in the air about what the shoulders should be doing. You know, the G1 RS is basically slicked down in the middle with some knobs on the side, which don't really engage until you're leaning over it when you need them. So I think that makes good sense. And that's a good, uh, you know, all around tire, I think for most of us in terms of a gravel race tire. At Steamboat, there was maybe one instance where I could have used a tire with some bite, which was after the one little water crossing, going up the greasy grass for about 10 pedal strokes. Greasy, greasy. I had to Oops. very carefully, you know, maintain a smooth pedal stroke because it was just, the rear tire was slipping around, but that was four seconds of a five hour day. So, you know, on the whole, I'm certainly happy with the slick tire. I've certainly used something close to a slick like the uh, Vittoria Torino Dry or Torino Zero at Mid-South, which is, fast when it's dry and then when it's muddy out there there's just less uh, rubber nooks and crannies for the mud to stick to so that's my preference that's my bias and that steamboat gravel uh, that type of tire proved to be a good one keegan swinson's tire if you're still here still watching you're probably still curious about that so i'll tell you <laughs> keegan uh, has maxis tires for a sponsor they have the receptor gravel tire, which is a 40 mil, which uh, is kind of like the speed or the, the the RS one in that it's slick for almost the entire tire with tiny little shoulder knobs on the sides. 40 is the smallest, the narrowest version that that comes in. Keegan figured that was a little too much tire, so he went with the cyclocross tire, the Speed Terrain, which is a 33 mil tire. That has bigger knobs on the side. Uh, I took a look at his tire and it looked a little different and asked him, uh, Keegan, did you cut the knobs off your tires? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> he just took some snips to him, uh, cut those bad boys off. So he had a, a 33 tire with, you know, just the faintest of tread, not just on the center, but then on the sides as well. Keegan went with uh, tire liners inside, you know, saying he absolutely wanted to avoid pinch flats. Keegan also ran some high pressure, 46 in the front, 48 PSI in the back. He told me that preventing pinch flats is huge and he said, I figured I'd prefer taking a beating over getting a flat. Guy was not there to be standing by the side of the road, he was there to win the bike race and he was not stopping. Just for context, you know, I was running like a you know, 37, 39 PSI front and rear. I weigh a few pounds more than Keegan. Uh, yeah, the tire's a little bit wider, so you know, your, your mileage may vary. I suggest using a 
calculator uh, that like some, a brand like Silka has or a brand like Envy has online where you can select your you know, internal rim width and your tire width and your body weight and it will give you a suggestion as to what to run. So I'd use that as a starting point and then go out and, and just ride that, see how it feels. Pump it up a little higher, see if you notice a difference. Take some air out, see if you know a difference and just find what you, is the sweet spot for you and, and uh, record that and then just use the same pump every time because different pumps may measure differently. So takeaway there is there's no one perfect right answer for everybody. Experiment, find what is good for you. Similarly, with course distance, I encourage you to pick one that you feel will be a good time. As Sarah Sturm's hat says, it's supposed to be fun. Sarah Sturm is an excellent gravel and mountain bike racer, of course, and is a wonderful person at keeping it fun. That's what we're doing here, right where this is a recreational activity for so many of us, even if, even those of us trying to get a result. Steamboat gravel certainly was fun for me on race day and on the days leading up to it. I'm already looking forward to next year. So thanks to Amy and the crew there for putting on a good party. Thanks to everyone in the events for bringing the party. I'm Ben Delaney. If you like this, please subscribe. And I hope to see you at Steamboat Gravel next year or at another gravel events in the future.